I want to welcome you to this Impact Collaborative. It happens to be Native Women's Equal Pay Day. Thank you so much to our dear, dear friends and partners at the YWCA for letting us know and for sharing. We want to welcome the game-changing leaders and experts who are here today, both on and off camera. <laughs> so this poll is our first request for an exchange of information with you. Please participate throughout the time we are here together, all the way through to our post Zoom survey. You give your input and you take away tools and resources that will be offered to you today. So we have a great, wonderful new feature in these impact collaboratives. Those of you who are interested in connecting afterwards with any of the presenting organizations or speakers will be connected later by our team. All you have to do is indicate that in the next poll response that you do. Building connections is important and strengthens the fabric of our community. This is something that your Women's Fund takes very, very seriously because indeed we are stronger together. So today with us, we have a very strong representation of Women's Fund board members who are working diligently to support the focusing power of this crucial gender lens on our community. We thank representatives of Senator Donna Shalala, the Miami-Dade Commission for Women, the National Association of Women Business Owners, the Commonwealth Institute, a great representation of academics, attorneys, bankers, and direct service providers, and you each and all for being here. An impressive RSVP turnout. Go one team. We also have engaged donors who lead with their committed financial support of women and girls from large endowments to grassroots contributors like many of you here today. The Miami Dolphins Football Unites are the ongoing sponsor of this Impact Collaborative series and we thank them. Uh, we're working really closely with them. Uh, have you seen the fabulous PSAs from the Dolphins players on our social media? If you haven't, please tune in and share. Kaufman Rawson, a committed equal pay company is an additional sponsor of this Impact Collaborative, along with this public awareness campaign. And now, in partnership with the League of Women Voters and Vote the Future, we would like to hear unveil our new collaborative campaign that will premiere October 5th and be seen across roadside billboards and bus shelters through Election Day, November 3rd. Donors and sponsors made this possible. Thank you. I personally am taking my ballot to the polls on October 24th, National Voter Day. Empowered action instead of procrastination. Please see our social media for information on National Voter Day that focus on October 24th and getting ahead of the game and information for free transportation for those who need it. So. We all know that we have many, many stars in Miami. And now I'm gonna introduce you to one who you may not yet know, a data-driven, evidence-based leader and our newest Women's Fund Miami-Dade board member, today's keynote speaker, Dr. Maria Ilcheva. Maria, welcome. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, the Women's Fund. Uh, um, I'll have uh, Vivi change my slides, right, Vivi? Um, it, it's a pleasure to be among uh, so many amazing women. Um, I need that, that's how I, I want to start, just how honored I am to, to participate in this particular collaborative and hear from this group of women talk about an issue that is personally and professionally so important to me. Um, I will be brief uh, talking the, uh, about the topic of pay equity um, from a more ma macro perspective, showing some of the data I've been looking um, over the years, both locally and nationally. Um, and while sometimes it feels that we know a lot and everyone understands the presence of pay inequity, I, I think it's still important to continue to provide this evidence as I see gaps in understanding and awareness. Let me give you an example. Um, according to a poll of almost 9,000 American adults from last year, March last year, nearly half of men believe that the pay gap is, uh, and I quote, made up to serve a political purpose, rather than being a legitimate issue. 
Uh, about a quarter of men ages 18 to 34 say that uh, media reports of men and women being paid unequally are fake news, which was one of the options provided in the poll. Overall, about 38% of Americans believe, uh, uh, do not believe that men make more money than women. So over a third of, of um, our residents believe that. But the evidence is that there remains a disparity in how men and women are paid, even when all factors are controlled, meaning that women are still being paid less than men due to no attributable reason other than gender. As our data shows, the gender pay gap is wider for women of color, women in executive level roles, and women in certain occupations and, and industries. On my next uh, slide, uh, on my data slide here, you see some of uh, the information that we've been reporting in um, our annual status of women report in Miami-Dade County. It shows that when adjusted for inflation, first of all, wage gro growth in our county has been non-existent. Uh, when earnings are adjusted for inflation, in fact, women in 2018 earned about 2% less than they did in 2010. Similarly, men's earnings were about 7.7% less. The gap between uh, men's and women's earnings is still significantly lower in 2018, about 11%, than it was in 2010, when it was over 16%. And that's as a result of the bigger dip in, um, of men's earnings in real value. Uh, over the, the decade, the last decade, the average gap has been about 13%. Um, I, I will mention this later on, but uh, we have newer data from, uh, from the US Census that uh, came out recently, um, and it's, it's not very uh, encouraging. Um, actually, the, in 2019, the gap for full-time uh, workers, men and women, full-time workers, increased to 2000 to 20% in 2019. Uh, it, uh, in, in Miami-Dade County. Nationally, the gap was 19%. So now uh, the gap, uh, which has typically been lower in Miami-Dade, is larger than the national gap. On my next slide, um, um, I show you some of the data across occupational groups in Miami-Dade County. We see double-digit gaps across uh, these 10 uh, highest earning occupations for women. Uh, the challenge I want to note, and I, I'm, I'm sure some of you are, well, can um, um, understand that as, as well as you look at, at these numbers, is that these occupational categories include a broad range of occupations. For example, uh, the legal uh, category includes lawyers, law clerks, paralegals, judges, etc. Similarly, for management, it ranges from chief executives to financial managers to um, education administrators, uh, marketing, etc. Et so these are broad categories, uh, which may be exaggerating inequity because of the concentration of women in, in certain occupations. For example, we know there are fewer uh, women who are attorneys uh, and more women who are paralegals. My next slide shows some national data since uh, local data by specific occupation is, is not available. This shows gaps for, for select occupations. There, there are just too many occupation, uh, occupations to show in one slide, over 500 uh, when they're broken, uh, broken up by um, more specific groups. But the gaps, what, what, what this means is, uh, what this shows is that the gaps are present for both occupations in which women are the majority of the workforce, as well as for others in which there are smaller proportions. Uh, for example, there are 1.6 million women employed as secretaries, and the gap is about 11%. Women are also the majority of financial managers, uh, and the gap there is 35%. Uh, you also see uh, what I mentioned earlier, the breakdown of, of some of the legal occupations. Uh, indeed, there is still a gap for um, male versus female attorneys. All of the largest occupations with over 1 million full-time workers, again, national data, show some degree of earnings gap. Uh, the pattern remains for most of these occupations, even when accounting for educational attainment. In fact, the gap widens for occupations that require higher educational attainment. On my next slide, uh, I'll show you the comparison of full-time workers with bachelor's degrees by sector in Miami-Dade County. Um, again, um, the, the double-digit gaps are evident. Uh, we used to think that these gaps, um, years ago when we started um, um, looking into, into the pay gap, we used to think that, the pro that they are the product of educational attainment, but that argument is no longer valid. 
In fact, women now surpass men in terms of educational attainment. There are more women than men with bachelor's degrees and, and higher. Uh, college degree, as I mentioned, does widen the gap uh, with bachelor's degrees um, uh, leading to uh, men, being pay men with bachelor's degrees being paid about 69,000 um, in, in earnings versus 48,000 for, for women. So on my next slide, uh, I thought uh, um, and um, to, to kind of put a, an impact, uh, put together some impact numbers. What are the consequences of, of the pay gap? They are significant both in terms of earnings, uh, individual earnings for women, as well as overall economic impact. Uh, the 11%, I used the 2018 uh, number of 11% um, gap for Miami-Dade County, resulted in over $2 billion loss. Um, in other words, if women were paid equally, if the gap was non-existent, women and families, I should note, uh, would have added an additional $2 billion in earnings to, uh, to their spending power. Full-time working women lost over $4,000 um, uh, um, in, in earnings in 2018, but this loss, as I mentioned, varies by occupation. For example, the gap in law enforcement was almost 27000 for health diagnosing and treating practitioners, which is a very popular profession for women, the difference was almost 9,000. If the gap was eliminated, uh, it would cut poverty in half as more women and again families move out of the, this group that we call the working poor. As a result of the increased spending power of households, um, another 1 billion uh, could uh, be added to the local economy because of, of, of the ripple effect. This is a um, an impact analysis that we do with economic impact modeling. As a result of the circulation of these additional $2 billion in, in earnings, another $1 billion will, would be gen generated through household purchases uh, of, of uh, goods and services. So uh, another interesting calculation that I made is that, again, using the 2018 data, if women's earnings increase by only half a percent faster than men's earnings annually, 2.5% for men versus 3% for, for women, which are both um, uh, rates higher than the inflation, we could have closed the gap in 25 years. Um, however, and as I mentioned earlier, and this is why we monitor change over time, uh, rather than just producing a snapshot every decade or, or so, the gap for full-time workers in 2019 increased to 20%, as, as I said. Um, the gap widened because, because of the decrease in women's earnings uh, compared to 2018 and the increase in men's earnings. Um, I put together some information um, um, that I, I've been looking at based on my, my research about the reasons uh, for, for the gap. Uh, this uh, slide, the next slide shows that beyond the numbers, we know there are broader systemic reasons for the persistence of the gap. It's the result of factors that include occupational segregation, employer bias um, which, uh, against working mothers, which is also called the, the motherhood penalty, and uh, direct pay discrimination. Um, employers' practices such as using prior salary history in setting current pay and prohibiting employees from discussing their wages compound the problem. Uh, now, wage skeptics emphasize that women choose different and lower paying college majors than men, implying that such differences mean that the wage gap measure is, is not a good measure of economy-wide wage inequality. But are women's choices really choices? Um, the research shows that there is evidence of barriers to free choice of occupations, which range from lack of unbiased information about prospect, job prospects, to actual harassment and discrimination in male-dominated jobs. In fact, young women and men generally express the same range of desires regarding their future careers in terms of such values as making money, having autonomy and flexibility at work, as well as time to spend uh, with their family. Um, additionally, things like racial bias, disability, access to education, and age come into play. Um, as a result, different groups of women experience very different gaps in, in pay. And my final slide, um, um, I'm, I'm looking at how can we address uh, the, these gaps. Um, there is significant evidence uh, uh, 
uh, from individual companies as well, uh, as, well as from my, uh, my international research, mainly from European countries that have taken steps to, to address the, the pay gap, uh, that uh, there are ways in, in which we can, we can act, in, in which we can be proactive. Uh, the first step, uh, as, as I mentioned, is addressing um, the issue by raising awareness and building that recognition that the gap is real and persistent. We also need leadership in implementing solutions uh, to, to erase disparities. Uh, one often mentioned example, I'm sure you've, you've heard, it's, 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 not a, it's not a new example, but it has, um, um, it has been, uh, it, it was probably the most visible one at the time, about a decade ago, is the Boston Compact, in which the mayor of the city led the signing of a compact in which 100 companies committed to eliminate the gap. We need to motivate employers to review their hiring practices to ensure there is no bias against women. Equal pay should be part of corporate social responsibility, which, which means companies cannot just focus purely on, on profit. We need to change the perception that women cannot be successful in certain industries or occupations or as business owners. Uh, we also need to encourage women to pursue degrees that lead to higher earning potential. Science, technology, engineering, math, the STEM degrees, business, and, and the legal uh, field. We also need to support uh, female entrepreneurs, ensuring that their businesses survive and grow. Um, surveys show actually that mentorship and networking are important uh, to, to women entrepreneurs to, on, uh, um, at a larger scale or um, more, more so than for men. And uh, obviously social activism um, is, is an important uh, motivational force and a pressure point that can stimulate the private sector to exercise social responsibility. Um, so we each have a role to play all, all these uh, different actions. You, you see they, they pertain to government, academics such as uh, myself, um, businesses them, themselves and society. We each have a role to play and obviously more work to do but I'm hopeful and optimistic that through partnerships and collaboratives such as this, we can elevate our voices and, and bring about change. Um, I'll conclude here. I want to thank you again, um, and I look forward to the panel discussions and your comments and, and questions later on. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maria. I have to say, takeaways are exciting because this group can have a real ripple effect in our local economy and cutting poverty in half. These, these are goals that we can measure, and this is work that, that we can do. There are best practices. It's exciting to see um, this continuing conversation today. So this is how it's gonna work. As you know, those of you who always join our impact collaboratives and welcome to those of you who are new, we need and want to hear from you. Please post your questions for Dr. Ilcheva, in addition to the panelists, here in our Q&A icon, we're gonna to get to as many as we possibly can at, at the end after the panelists speak. Um, we ask you to please also participate and post up to three challenges that you see with today's topic and potential solutions, large and small. How would you contribute? Please give your creative suggestions. Your input is crucial. We collect it and compile it and it is uh, it does inform our advocacy efforts. Uh, we'll be conducting two more polls throughout this webinar to record, uh, to record your opinions as well as our exit survey. And for all of you who don't understand how important that is, just trust me. We need your input. We thank you for it. And uh, it's, it's measurement tools that, that we're going to use. So panelists, now I'm going to ask you to please join me in dedicating this special impact collaborative to these five amazing interns. Camila, Madison, Sophia, Elizabeth, Vanessa, dedicated to them and the future that they represent. Please take Melinda Gates warning and let's make sure that change happens in their lifetime and does not take 208 years. So panelists, now, it's your turn. Thank you so much. I ask you to each uh, introduce yourselves in, in no more than two minutes, just in context of today's topic, because we know that uh, each of you is worthy of your own additional uh, impact collaborative. But two minutes, please. Samaria, welcome. Oh, 
Well, good morning, everyone. First of all, uh, Maria, I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you for this incredible opportunity. And um, as I was listening to our, our good doctor share the statistics, I feel like I am part of those. I was part of that group for a number of years. Certainly, I'm a woman of color. And, um, but I had all of those different things that she talked about, an advanced degree, all those incredible things. And I still found myself at a crossroads where I knew that I had a significant pay gap relative to my, my peers. Um, can we advance the slide? I wanna give you an idea a little bit of, of who I am and, and know that um, the journey of me being here today has not been an easy one. But I will say the one thing that I do wanna talk about a little bit further in the program, I took action. I did something different. I didn't wait for the government to tell me to do something. I didn't wait for my employer to do something different. I personally took action. And we'll talk a little bit about some of the things that I did where I recognize that my self-worth added up to my net worth. So let me tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I was born and raised in public housing. I'm not fancy by any means. I was born in the projects in Huntsville, Alabama. I came from a single parent home. Again, all the things that Maria talked about. Um, my mom was an incredible person. She taught us some really incredible values. Risk taking, um, I was always a giver, I was a fighter, and I always saw myself as having no limits on what I could do. Um, from a degree perspective, I have an undergraduate degree in accounting and finance, and I have a master's and MBA from Harvard Business School. Now, over the course of my career, I'm currently the CEO and president of Chapman Partnership. But before I came to Chapman, I've been here for about a year and a half, um, I have been able to lead a lot of incredible organizations. I have 25 years of experience in the field of medical technology. I've been able to build a $100 million business for a financial service company. Um, I was promoted to vice president in less than 18 months when I first started in healthcare, running a $500 million business. Um, I led one of the largest businesses at Baxter Healthcare, a $2.1 billion business. And just recently, back in 2016 to 2018, I was president at a medical technology company in London, England, where my portfolio was $1.7 billion. And I also ran all of research and development. Um, as part of my experience with, with my company, the company was called Convitec. I was also on the executive committee that led the largest IPO in Europe's history for a healthcare listed company. I'm an athlete. I'm a 13 time run, marathon runner. I have a 20 month old son. It says 11 months, but he's 21 months. I'm a wife and so much more. So you would think that with a pedigree and a list of experiences like that, how did I find myself with a pay gap? Well, I tell you, it happened. Um, I'm gonna hold off and telling you how I was able to come out of that because that's the, that's the beauty of being part of this discussion. But I will tell you, um, I did. And I'm gonna tell you what I, what I did, specifically actions that I took that helped me understand my value equation and how I promoted that to my employer. So with that, I am done with my introduction and thank you so much. And what an introduction, thank you so much. Lynn, welcome. There you go. Good morning, I think I'm off mute now, right? Yes. I, I think that's the, uh, the most often quoted uh, phrase for 2020 is you're on mute, right? And uh, I just wanted to start with my uh, thank you uh, to the Women's Fund. It's just truly an honor and a pleasure to represent the private sector here this morning. And a special shout out to Janet Altman. I know she's in the audience. I can't see you, Janet, but I really want to thank you uh, for reaching out to me and introducing me to the Women's Fund that before you had, um, you know, opened my awareness, I didn't know existed. So uh, thank you, Janet. And uh, and, and thank you, Samari. It's uh, certainly, uh, I'm thrilled to be part of this panel and uh, will offer my introduction as well. I am, uh, I'm either change adverse or I am uh, pretty stable. I'm not sure which, but um, you know, I've lived in uh, Miami since I was two years old. And the only time that I didn't live in Miami uh, was I was born out in California and my father was um, 
a civilian in the Navy. And then my parents actually were both born in Miami, brought the family back to Miami, and I've been here ever since. And I, I love travel. Hence, you know, my uh, career has been in the, mostly in the travel industry. Um, but I always find myself uh, just really appreciating and returning to uh, Miami and South Florida. And so I went to high school here in Miami. I was the first graduating class of Miami Sunset Senior High. But then I, I did get the travel bug. And when I was looking at colleges, I wanted nothing to do with Florida, despite having fabulous, you know, uh, secondary uh, education institutions in Florida. I went up to Penn State. I loved it. It was a great college experience, although I'll tell you, it was really cold. And the one thing I learned was uh, seasons are longer than three months each, especially winter. And I uh, got my accounting degree um, in Penn State, came back to the University of Miami and got a master's in tax. And so that was, you know, what I had gravitated to is really the math, uh, finance, accounting, and tax started my career in public accounting here with Price Waterhouse for five years, a great you know, training ground and a learning base. And then um, as typical of many uh, colleagues in public accounting, found myself moving toward uh, one of my clients. And one of my clients uh, was in the cruise industry. So my career out after public accounting, after that first five years has been solely in the cruise industry, two different employers. Uh, and although that sounds uh, stable it is. I've, I've had the opportunity to say yes to many opportunities along the way um, with many different functions. So I started with the tax function, which I thought uh, was great because way back in the day in 1990 when I joined the cruise industry, the cruise industry didn't pay tax. They pay a lot of tax now. Um, but of course, um, uh, that uh, they were a little smarter than I was. And so asked me to pick up some other functions. So I've led functions including insurance placement, um, medical operations, uh, defensive guest claims, crew claims, crime reporting. And then I did have the opportunity at my current employer about 10 years ago to move into the human resource function. And uh, we joke to this day that I accepted it temporarily. And I always tell our interns or our you know, younger you know, talent recruits that I'm a perfect example of not planning out your life too linearly or, or you know, too far down the path, be open to new experiences. Because I, when I was in college, I never would have thought of human resources as a career. And I find that um, you know, it's really, of all the functions that I've led, it's the one that I enjoy the most and believe I have the most impact. And I am also a, a working mother. I have two teenagers. Uh, one is a sophomore in college. She's out of state. Um, so um, I guess she comes by that honestly, right? She, uh, she chose to go out of state to college as well. I have a son who is a junior in high school. And uh, I really think that probably the best experience or one of the best experiences for my current function, which is, you know, leading talent and human resources across our international company is really, you know, parenting. There's just a lot of commonality um, and, uh, and I've, I've enjoyed the journey. I look forward to seeing where it leads next, but most importantly, and most immediately, I look forward to sharing the panel with these fabulous ladies that, um, that I share the panel with. So thank you. Well, it is so incredible to have the private sector represented by such a strong person and in this, uh, uh your, your company being an equal pay company is um is going to provide great leadership and hopefully opportunities for other people to envision as they hear you speak later today lynn because uh, uh, it, it is possible so onward we're going to go next to monica please welcome hey everybody um and caro or vivi uh thank you so much for running the the logistics of all of this here's a photo of me back when we all could still travel wherever we wanted um so i actually come from a very different background from both of these um really incredible women i am born and raised in miami dade and 
Um, there was nothing I hated more than Miami and needed to leave. So I did leave, go to college um, at New York University, and I got my bachelor's in fine arts at the Tisch School um, in film and television. And I worked for a while in film and television. And then I um, met the, the love of my life who um, ended up getting very sick. And we had to um, move to Chicago for a while while um, he was getting treatment. And we stayed for, for several months in a hospital together. And um, it kind of changed my life. And I, I thought about what kind of work I was doing and what kind of work I wanted to be doing. and. Um, so when we returned to Miami, I uh, enrolled in nursing prereqs and went to um, the University of Miami Nursing School. I worked in oncology nursing for a while and um, in school health. And there was something that wasn't sitting quite right with me with direct patient care, even though um, I really loved it because I was seeing all of the baggage that patients were coming in with before they got here, you know, before they got to the hospital. And I wanted to really address that population level health um, rather than individual level health. So I went to um, uh, Johns Hopkins and got my master's in public health and um, that's what I really focus on. So I'm coming at this from a very different lens than Samiria um, because I, I really want to take the onus away from an individual. I think it's really important to uh, give people uh, knowledge and education around how they can um, change their, their status. But I, I really focus on um, the population level changes and that research. And thank you so much, Dr. Cheva, for your research. That is, is super useful. So now I work at the, um, I'm the director of the Commission for Women at the county, and we do a, amazing advocacy work and work in tandem with Dr. Cheva at the FIU Metropolitan Center um, to create policy recommendations at the county level. And I'm also the president of League of Women Voters, inspiring and empowering people to vote as well as um, uh, advocacy work. Thank you so much, Monica. And we will be asking you to talk about the public sector equal pay policies in your role here today. So thank you so much, Natalia. Please introduce yourself in context of today's topic. Welcome. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. This is such an exciting panel. Um, thank you again for inviting all of us and I'm really thrilled to be in such fantastic and inspiring company for such a needed and important topic. So thank you all for joining. So my name is Natalia Martinez Kalinina. I, on the personal side, I am half Cuban and half Russian. I grew up in Cuba, Russia, and Mexico before coming to the U.S. In the U.S., I lived uh, briefly in South Florida and then in Boston for five years, in New York for five years before returning to South Florida for what I believed was going to be a year. And then I'm still here eight years later. So <laughs> actually today is my eight year anniversary. So um, that feels apropos. In terms of my background or my kind of academic and professional background, I am an organizational psychologist by training. So um, I have a degree in psychology and political science from Harvard and a master's in organizational psychology from Columbia. My background is very much the part of psychology that looks at groups of people. And there's a really big focus within that, looking at organizations and human capital strategy practices. So I've definitely advised a lot of companies around building teams. I have built my own teams. It's one of the things that I most enjoy. And it goes without saying, but I'll say it explicitly anyway, that compensation and pay structures are a really big part of how we really need to be thinking about, and we already are, but how we need to be thinking about creating teams, incentivizing teams, empowering teams um, in our organizations across the public and private sphere. More recently, so in Miami, my trajectory has been a little bit varied. I've worked in the in New York, I worked in the private sector, doing consulting, and in, what brought me to Miami was actually a job. So I was running part of the strategy for um, Ultimate Software, which at the time was a around like a $5 billion software firm. It was my, my foray into the technology space, which was really new for me at the time. But since then, I've gotten deeply, deeply involved in the entrepreneurial ecosystem here locally. So I spent the last five years running the expansion of the Cambridge Innovation Center to Miami, where we're building an innovation district, um, founding a variety of organizations that focus 
very much on bridging gaps. Um, some of them around gender, some of them are around, around not. We include Awesome Foundation, Mint Ventures, and Infirm Empowered, a variety of other initiatives. But all of this to say that my perspective in this conversation is very much anchored around the investment topic, the startup topic, the entrepreneurship topic, um, and kind of what are the conversations around compensation and gender equity gaps in this um, in these ecosystems as they are being formed and forged. Um, I personally think it's a really exciting frontier, but it's also deeply imperfect. And so I'm particularly excited to compliment our perspectives on the panel. Thank you for having me. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Natalia. So we are focused here today on the economic benefits of achieving equal pay. And we know that there are challenges to that. Uh, we know that the, your cruise line, Lynn, has, has achieved that. We know that the county has a policy. We know it is possible, but there are challenges. And many of the people who are in our audience and who will be listening to this recording later are going to be dealing with those challenges. They might, might wish to join uh, your cruise line, Lynn, in, in your equal pay policy in Kaufman Ross, and but they, you know, they don't know how to tackle it. Can you just speak briefly? I think since we're running a little bit behind, maybe two, two and a half minutes about those challenges because we need to get to the solutions. Samaria. Absolutely. Well, I, I know there's a number of different angles that we're we're really focusing on, and I really want to hit on the individual piece. And we have so many other incredible speakers here that can talk a little bit about government, corporate, and then also the overall ecosystem or overall population. But I want to just hit on a couple of things here. One of the things, and, and this is personal experience and also based on, on research, um, one of the things that I was often challenged with throughout my career is being able to feel confident and ask for a raise. Now, I, certainly that's not my where I am now, but as I started moving up in, um, in corporate, um, I, I wasn't comfortable in asking for that raise. And, and statistics have shown that um, women are less likely to do that. About 30% um, that were actually in this survey group indicated that they were not comfortable in asking for a raise. I think the one piece um, that really grabbed me, and it, re and it was actually a reflection back on when I first got into healthcare, is really being, a, being able to truly negotiate a salary, right? Being able to um, negotiate my starting salary as I started my new job. And some of the research has found that about 13% of women are less likely um, to negotiate their salary versus 52% of men. Um, now, when you do the math, you're like, well, that's not a big deal. They'll, they'll catch me up. You know, corporations will eventually figure that out and they'll catch me up. Um, but because of that, we have, we found ourselves leaving a lot of money on the table. Um, about a million and a half dollars are left on the table over the course of our career, literally because we have been apprehensive about negotiating a fair, what I consider a fair starting salary. Now, we do know the gap is somewhat shrinking, even though the doctor had mentioned that actually, you know, the latest research is showing a little bit of a, of an expansion. Um, but there is, you know, there cer certainly is some promise. But um, women today are earning 82 cents less than their men counterparts. Um, talk about, again, a, a pay gap, right? So, um, but I know there's more discussion on this, but this, I, again, taking it from the individual perspective, I've lived all of these. I certainly understand them, and I think they're all um, true. Um, certainly, there's some solutions that we can talk about specifically in terms of what I did, but uh, we're still leaving a lot of money on the table, women, a lot of money on the table. Um, one of the things that also gave me hope and inspiration as I started thinking through this topic, I, you know, it starts basically down to how I feel about myself, right? I know we're all incredible women and, and you get us behind doors and, and we have these conversations and we realize, hey, I am actually a superwoman. You know, I wear many hats. I, you know, I talked about me. I'm a mother. I'm, a, I'm an athlete. I am a wife. I am the CEO of an organization. There's so many things that a lot of you have, have done in your, your career and, your, and also in your, in your lifetime. Um, but the other thing, too, is that we must also take that same inspiration and that same confidence we're talking about our own value equation and being able to communicate that to our employer. 
Um, the other thing is that we've always been big on taking care of others. That's the one thing that women are often known. We, we do a really good job of taking care of others, but this topic today is talking about taking care of ourselves. So the other thing too that I also found um, when I started working through this, um, you know, women have always been taught to choose, right? Either I'm gonna be a mom, I'm gonna be a stay-at-home mom, which is an incredible, incredible job because I'm a new mom. Um, but we always have been taught to choose between being a working, you know, a working career person or let's say a mom. Um, and we always were told, you know, you can have one or the other. But I believe that we can have it all. We can have our cake and eat it too, right? The old saying is that you can't have your cake and eat it too. I believe that we can. Um, but we first must believe that we can do that. And that part of that is defining your, your, your self-worth and also having specific goals to achieve that. Next slide, do I have another slide? Okay, so we'll get to Lynn. And, and Lynn, and if you can tell us, you know, Norwegian Cruise Lines has overcome challenges that I'm sure that you see as an HR person that many other corporations face. Can you help give some pointers here? Yes, absolutely. Let's see. Okay, great. You can hear me? Yes, perfect. Um, and and I will uh, certainly do that. But first, I, I must say I congratulate the creative team behind the uh, the equal pay you know billboards. When I was driving down and I saw that for the first time, it really struck me as a wow because what better way to get someone's attention? Because often you know people think oh that doesn't apply to me and you kind of keep driving. Um, but especially if uh, you know, to get the attention of the, the male audience and bring it home to their family or their daughter, um, I thought was just uh, brilliant. So truly my congratulations to, uh, to the creative team behind that. I think it's incredibly powerful. And when I think about um, when we were initially introduced to the Women's Fund and asking if we were, you know, willing to take the equal pay pledge, I remember bringing that to our CEO and he almost thought it was a trick question at first because he said, well, of course, you know, that's who we are. That's what we do. That's how we think. Um, and I realized that, you know, I have been fortunate in, in my career, not only at Norwegian Cruise Line Holdings, but I've been fortunate in my career that although there were many instances and particularly earlier in my career where I was the sole woman in the room, um, it's unfortunately not as common an event today. Um, but I, I don't feel that, you know, I had ever, I, I was fortunate in that I was partnered with organizations that I felt saw me as a leader or an executive or a team member as opposed to, you know, a female or a male. And so, you know, when I brought that question to our CEO and his natural reaction was, you know, but of course, you know, I think that's one of the benefits is you have to come by this, um, you know, in some cases you have to build a program if you're not already there, but in other cases, it's toned from the top and the organization's culture is built that way, you know, to begin with. But then you, I realized, you know, I moved from feeling fortunate to realizing that you have a responsibility and a power to do everything you can to allow others to feel as fortunate. And so, you know, when I think about gender pay equity, and of course, we'll, we'll talk about, you know, kind of our programs and how we um, affect that, I think it's much broader than pay. And some of the issues that my fellow panelists have already brought up, you know, it, it, uh, it's education, it's development, you know, training and, and making sure that, um, you know, uh, females have the same opportunities throughout each of those spectrums. You know, mentoring, you know, we have a, a, a mentoring program at my company that I'm very proud of. And it started from a networking session of our female executive networking group. And it was really just a discussion of women. And somebody said, hey, you know, why don't we form a mentoring program? And the first year, it was uh, a mentoring program ex exclusively for our female talent. And it was successful and terrific. And we ran it for the year, mostly informal, but some structured programs. And then the next year um, and following that, the past several years, we have opened it up 
um, you know, so it's, you know, it's gender blind and men do participate. Um, but that I think has been particularly impactful um, to have a strong program of mentoring and then moving into sponsorship in addition to mentoring. Um, we were joking at one of our female executive networking panels that we hosted for our frontline talent, you know, I, I, myself and, uh, you know, fellow panelists, you know, I, I think you joke, you wake up one day and you realize you're a role model, but you don't know where along the, the line, you know, that happened. And again, that comes with the responsibility that, um, that I feel and I know is shared by, you know, so many to, um, you know, to share that good fortune with others and, and lead others to, um, you know, to making decisions that will support not only their careers and equal pay. And I fully agree with Samaria when you um, think about the difference in negotiating, you know, between men and women. And um, nothing inspires me more when I have females in our organization really negotiate for their salaries, but um, what we've done also, though, is put in place programs, which I'll, I'll save a little bit for the solutions segment as we, you know, run through the panel. Um, so we're not reliant upon a bold, courageous woman negotiating for her salary. Um, that's terrific, but we'd like it to be broader than that to help others with the confidence that maybe aren't quite so bold. Um, if I think about the uh, statistics, you know. Um, I'll focus first on our shipboard environment because our shipboard team is clearly the larger of our, our teams. We have over 32,000 you know, team members on, on our ships and working on our ships. And there, that was a predominantly male profession for so many years, because if you think about it, these uh, crew members and officers are away from their families for you know, up to eight months at a time. And we have um, really pushed our, our female hiring and looked at contract links and looked at our environment to allow it to be more welcoming to women. And now I'm pleased to say that we have um, about a quarter of the shipboard team, you know, is female. And then if I bring it into the, um, the office and we have about uh, 4,000 team members in the office, um, roughly half, 49% overall of our managers and above are women. And then we measure at different management points. So 49% of the management team are women, 45% uh, of our director team, which is two levels up and you know, elevated in management. And our officers are 26% female, which is slightly above the S&P 500. Uh, we're never finished. Um, and again, if you think at the top of our board of directors, 30% are women. And, I have noticed that um, more and more companies are making progress in their gender parity, starting with the board, but throughout the leadership and management of the organization. Um, and so, you're muted, Maria. I'm sorry, Lynn. Sorry. In fact, we'll go on to solutions there afterwards. Since we're running a little bit behind, I'm going to ask Monica just two minutes, please, about what's happening here in Miami-Dade County public sector. Please go ahead. Don't worry. I will be speedy because I want to get to our Q&A and our panel discussion. Um, so if you want to go to the next slide, perfect. Um, so I've identified six main barriers um, that I'm excited to talk about solutions for. So one of the first ones is um, the lack of internal or external pay transparency, you're setting folks up to fail. And there's a domino effect with, with pay transparency. So when a job posting doesn't contain a salary or at least a range, you go in completely blind. And then you run the risk of bringing with you all the bias from your prior employment if an employer asks you for a prior salary. Um, and it's, it's very uh, difficult to find valid pay ranges for what you should be paid. Um, you know, I think we've all had that night before trying to scrounge around Glassdoor to figure out how much you should be paid for something. And that's just not how it should work. Um, and then there's a, a societal um, problem that we have with a um, considering discussing pay to be gauche. And that's not serving us. That is serving businesses and business leaders. And then... Um, the individualization versus the, the common good. This is a changing um, prioritization, but 
um, while it's important to teach people to negotiate and have, um, you know, things, things like that, different sessions, um, individual choices aren't choices for everyone, like Dr. Ejiba said, and these need to be systemic changes to our structure so that somebody um, can be paid what they, what they deserve and a living wage without having to have external knowledge about it. And then, um, there's, there's some factors regarding um, how businesses prioritize um, employees and increasing benefits in terms of retention. And then it is very difficult to push new labor practices and regulations, especially for local government to do so. And we're best suited to do that and decide these practices because um, local governor, uh, governors and commissioners and mayors have the best understanding of, of what their community needs and the makeup of their community. And then finally, um, we have a big meritocracy problem. We overvalue certain educational successes and, and certain kinds of employment over others. So this creates systemic in inequities uh, wherein people believe a lawyer, for example, inherently deserves more than a nursing assistant or a janitor. And believe me, I've fallen for it as well. Um, in all of our introductions, you heard us listing off how proud we are to go to Harvard and Hopkins and Columbia. Um, so we, we have built in this societal shrine to education and we embed that into um, often unnecessarily into stipulations for job descriptions that bar people without certain access from achieving higher paying jobs. And um, we just need to be able to embed dignity in all of our jobs, not just include benefits as rewards for higher education. That's Fantastic. Thank you so much. You know, we have representatives of Honey Shine and the Overtown Youth Center in our audience today. And I think that message is going to be taken back to the, the, the folks that they're working with. Thank you so much, Natalia. Um, so I think I will keep it brief because I also want to get um, kind of to the portion to our next portion looking at solutions. But a couple of, of points I'd like to highlight from the startup and tech community. And to answer your question around challenges and obstacles, I think um, the first is really around representation. And so the technology and startup and investment space has over the last, not even five years, but let's call it five years, been starting to focus more heavily on the main topic of representation. As a result, um, I think the conversation around pay equity is the next stage in that evolution and the next stage in the maturation of that conversation. But currently the first chapter, shall we call it, of the conversation has just been, we need more women at the table. Um, I think this is a, to be completely kind of transparent, I think this is a great, uh, a great movement, a great conversation. I think in the technology workforce, the last numbers are the women make up less than 30%. I think it's about 28, 29% in terms of technology across different size of companies. So we're still pretty low overall, even though all of us know women who work in the technology space, either as kind of directly technology workers, coders, et cetera, or as in leadership roles, but it's, it still has a way from getting to a place of parity. So I understand companies, investors, uh, boards focusing on this conversation around how do we have more women at the table, either as employees, um, as leadership roles, and on boards, which I think is great. The next chapter of this, I do believe, has to include conversations around gender, um, kind of pay equity, and other topics that relate to the human capital strategy pieces of how we incentivize and, uh, and negotiate with transparency around some of these other topics. But currently, I think it's been, the focus has been a little bit more on that. Um, so that's kind of one topic, the focus on representation. The other point I'd like to say is, is really kind of the conversation around funding. So um, generally year over year in the US, about two to three percent of venture capital funding that is invested in companies is invested in women. So two to three percent, less than three percent of all venture capital funding that is invested in the US goes to women, which if you're appalled by that number, I hope you are because I do think it is appalling. Uh, I'm not even going to get into the statistics around Latina women, um, women of color, African American women, because it, it gets even more dismal. Um, and I think we, we, we can't kind of quite go down that rabbit hole right now, but it is pretty bad. This has all sorts of ripple effects. It is a really big challenge. There is 
um, kind of a variety of conversations around how to engage with this and how to fix this. There's sets of theories out there around how do we get more women on the investor side of the table? Um, how do we get more women to think differently about their money? So based on this theory that if we have more women on the investor side of the table, they will understand and be able to support and better invest in female founders. So it's kind of a, a double bind issue to a certain extent. Um, through one of the organizations that I founded, and then to ventures, we focus very much on trying to create an educational pathway for women from either the philanthropic or kind of deeply philanthropic in our communities or who are at a stage in their professional and career development where they have disposable income for them to think about angel investing and invest, investing in startups as an expansion of their kind of financial portfolio as well as their philanthropic portfolio. And because there are so few women investors across the United States in general, Miami is not an exception to that. We are definitely part of that pattern and that norm. And it, it affects not just, there's an economic kind of development benefit because we are not investing in interesting ideas in our communities, but there's also a personal um, kind of set of liabilities because men are that men have historically invested a lot more in stocks kind of in retail markets and they have historically invested a lot more in startup in startup companies and so their returns and the possibility for the returns that they make from that personally or as a family unit as an individual are significantly higher and so even for those for women they're missing this opportunity to expand their own personal wealth as well as their impact so there's an interesting conversation there around both sides of the table. So how do we get more female investors and how do we get more female founders funded as well, which obviously ripples out onto pay equity because if you don't have money to start your company, you clearly don't have, or you have very little money to start your company as opposed to a male founder who received you know, millions and millions of dollars in a, in a funding raise. It affects the way that you're able to compensate and, and the possibility of success for your company. Brilliant. Thank you, Natalia. Solutions. Solutions. That's what we're here for. We know that we could cut poverty levels in half in Miami-Dade if we, if we bridge this gap. We see what it would do. Please help us create that ripple effect. Samaria. Solutions. Thank you. Thank you. You know, again, I think, you know, when I listen to all of our panelists and and attacking this from a number of different perspectives. Um, I, I do my best not to um, get discouraged, right? Because it's gonna take some time. Um, you know, our, our doctor put up some stats and I will tell you the, the numbers haven't changed very much over the last several years. And um, so, you know, and I, I certainly appreciate Lynn and the work that her company is doing but they are very, very far and few between that are actually taking this rallying cry and this call to do something different. Uh, particularly right now, we're looking at a, a, a time in our country and our world that we've never seen and the belts are tightening even more. So, um, so for me, my, you know, my mode is the individual really um, rooting for not only each other, but doing something that I think could help them move forward. Granted, it's not necessarily gonna solve the entire equation, but from an individual perspective, as governments and as companies work through this issue and, and figure out how we can close the gap, the individual also has to take a responsibility, at least during this time. And a few things, I'm not gonna go through everything, but, um, some of the things that, again, that I did over the course of my career is that I really had to understand my value. And understanding my value allowed me to communicate my value and go in and ask for that raise or negotiate that salary or have a seat at the table. Um, that's what I had to do. Uh, you know, certainly having a positive self-esteem, people think, well, that's not a big deal. Actually, it is. You get some women behind closed doors and you say, well, go in and ask for that race. They're like, well, I don't know. They're not going to, I'm going to ruffle too many feathers. I'm not quite sure. Um, but, you know, sometimes women are challenged with that. You know, look yourself in the mirror and say, do I have a positive self-esteem about the work that I do? And recognize the difference in the value that you create. There's nothing like, the, there's nothing like adding having facts on paper and understanding your value equation and being able to communicate that. Know the difference that you make. Um, certainly see yourself as, as your peer. And, um, and for those business owners, don't undercharge for your, for your services um, just because you want a seat at the table. And also, again, be very clear about the value that you bring to the table. 
um, and know that you are more than good enough. I say good enough, but more than good enough. And then the other piece is when we're engaging in things that are fulfilling and that we're, that we're excited about, we're gonna add that, that much more value. Again, this is my story. And I, and I will tell you, um, it, it has worked for me. I'm not waiting for the government to write a policy to make this happen. I'm not waiting for a corporation to tell me something different. I'm going to go in and I'm going to root for myself and certainly other women, but I'm going to make sure that I'm able to communicate the value that I bring to the table. Now, I'm not going to go through um, all of these, but um, it's almost a little bit of a repeat from the prior slide. Um, you know, certainly some of the things that I think is very important, list out the ways that you add value. You know, I gave you my, my CV and I, I added up all the points. I know exactly in every organization the value that I've been able to bring to the table. Um, and become assertive, you know, certainly become very, very assertive around um, who you are and what you do and push yourself out of your comfort zone. Um, so those are kind of the, the, the at least a couple of things that I do want to highlight. I know we have to have others that um, need to chime into this, but this is my story. You know, I came from being a, a young lady that grew up in public housing all the way up to now uh, where I am. And certainly my career is by far not over and I have a lot more runway, but I always take these principles as my foundation that I leverage in any other, any job that I have. And and um, so again, this is an individual perspective, and um, so I'm hopeful that this will help someone in the audience. Thanks so much, Lynn. All yours. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. And you know, I I sit here and and listen to the challenges and the issues, and I am, you know, equally disappointed, even though I recognize that some aspects of them are just hard to imagine when I think about. You know my company and what we've created so i wanted to start an offer to anyone in the audience that if i can help either adopt best practices or share more i know you started with that myra but truly i, I i'd love to you know uh, be a resource uh, to anyone out there in the audience but i think clearly if um in the private sector which is my experience base you really need to take a, a hard look at your overall compensation program and so whether it be, you know, shipboard or our corporate environment, it's important to have a, a position-based compensation program um, with transparent ranges um, and not uh, based upon experience or clearly not based upon what somebody earned in a prior role. So when you're looking at um, pay, it's not just a percentage increase over what somebody earned, but looking constantly refreshing these job descriptions and looking at the value of that position what the range is and th there may be reason for different uh you know there's a range right and there's a range for a reason and people will have different experiences that they bring but clearly making sure that the compensation is tied to the position as is as, as opposed to the history of the earning power of the individual and then even if you believe you have a gender blind or a gender neutral compensation system, I think it's incredibly important to look for inequities, you know, run statistics, um, you know, take a look, slice and dice the data and from several different directions and really look for inequities um, and then remain vigilant um, when you find them. I think it's important to immediately correct them. Um, not wait for the next pay cycle, the next annual cycle, but, uh, you know, so that you are constantly remaining vigilant and really looking for the inequities so you can solve them, you know, quickly. Another thing that we've done and I think is important and we've talked about it on the panel is, um, you know, to ensure balance is, you know, generally good across the board. So when you talk about functions that are predominantly female or predominantly male, introducing more of a gender balance into those uh, functions can really help um, solidify your equal pay practice. And, uh, and I, I wanted to echo a thought that was shared by one of my fellow panelists as well is I think the best advice that I can give to women as far as negotiating is to make sure that you negotiate just as hard for yourself as you would for others because it's true we are fiercely uh, loyal and uh, protective when it comes to our family, our colleagues, and others. 
and we need to treat ourselves exactly the same. And just if, if you need to pretend you're negotiating for somebody else, if that works for you, you know, then that's fine. But just make sure that you, you put yourself uh, first and that you uh, negotiate just as hard for yourself as you would for others. Thank you so much. Monica, Solutions from Miami-Dade County is a public entity. Awesome. Yeah, and thank you all for, for sharing your, your expertise and, and experience. Um, I, I wanted to touch that Natalia mentioned um, how important it is, it is to have women at the table, and, and that's um, certainly true, but um, going back to my public health roots, um, I'm sorry, there's some constraints in my building it, it, <laughs> um, if you hear some weird sounds um, but the women at the table argument is a start and not an end goal so just like more um, black people in a room won't solve racism uh, more women is not going to be a panacea for sexism so uh, a couple solutions for um, pay equity is um, something that Dr. Cheva has been working very closely with us on and um, that's specific local data. Um, I'm a very data driven person as we all should be and um, we need that specific data to see where the gaps are and how to fill them. And um, so the FIU Metropolitan Center is doing important work towards that solution. And then um, spreading pay transparency. The, gov the government has pay transparency. You can look up how much I make. Um, you can look up how much the mayor makes, anybody makes. And that's a really important piece to um, bring the private sector in on. And then uh, federal and state level legislation that increases the regulatory power of local governments to enforce regulations on private businesses. There was a, a question in the chat um, about how um, our local government can enforce this. And at the moment, the county can only really enforce county employers and how our employees and how those are regulated and how those jobs are, are, um, are worked as well as county contractors. Um, but we can't tell a, uh, the county can't tell a private business at this moment um, how, how to run their private business. Um, and then, uh, I'm going to drop a link in the chat. Um, we work at the Commission for Women on a report every year that we send with recommendations to the commissioners on how to improve equity and, um, and the status of women. And we are working with lots of community members to um, make sure these goals are um, transparent, make sure this operation is transparent, and most importantly, community-led. So you'll see in the chat a uh, survey about that we want community input on from all members of the community, absolutely ev anybody and everyone, so that um, so that the, the process of our making recommendations is community-led. Um, and then we need to overhaul and audit the traditional job posting, right? Do you need that bachelor's? Do you need that five plus years experience? Whatever it is. Um, we've all taken a closer look at our DEI commitments as uh, uh, employers or, or, or how, whatever your function is. And that's a, an, an essential part of that. And um, we need to talk about salary and make that culture shift. Um, this is a, a a low level risk for me, because like you said, you could look up my salary, I make $58,000. And if we did that uh, in the private sector, we would see a lot of changes, just culturally shifting from that um, embarrassment and uh, uh, sort of socialized way that we, are, we talk about um, salary right now. So interesting, so interesting, Natalia. Um, thank you everyone for sharing great thoughts um, guiding us kind of looking forward a little bit. So a couple of things from my end. Um, I think one very small thing that comes to mind is that kind of all of us should be trying to participate either in kind of private or proprietary data sets. So things like Glassdoor, etc. Um, the more people participate, 
the more the information that is offered there is realistic and the more there is actual data uh, kind of nationally to analyze disparities across not just race, but not just gender, but also race, um, kind of age, other elements. And so it's a small thing and it's not actually driving an immediate solution, but just something that I think all of us can do, go in and input our own um, our own salaries historically for different roles. That's one thing. Um, my general lens for solutions is really driven by my academic background, where I think, and, and I think it echoes some of the other comments from my fellow panelists, where it's not always about kind of changing the immediate bias, because those are elements that th those are processes that take a very long time and they're very individual. So we're not always aware of the biases that a particular individual or a set of individuals or what the biases that exist within a company. So it's not always about changing the bias, but it is about creating systems that limit the expression of that bias. And there is a lot of research, especially internally around hiring practices, um, compensation practices, raises, things of that nature that allow for there to be less of an express that limit the expression of the bias. So whether you, you know, it's like the, the easiest and the example that most people know is removing gendered pronouns and removing names from resumes when hiring um, allows for a very different association because people are evaluating not knowing the gender of the applicant. Um, it also helps with other kind of things like um, ethnicity and race because sometimes you're able to pick up on those cues from the name um, or some of the details of, of a particular applicant. And so removing some of those identifying markers can help. There are other, that's the example that I think most people are familiar with. There are other examples along those lines that help institute kind of limiting practices and limiting systems without kind of, while acknowledging that working on larger bias and institutional issues is something that takes time in a multi-pronged approach. Um, the other kind of thought I have very much kind of for the tech and especially the startup community is I think the big benefit is that when you're starting a company or you're a small enough company, you can really redefine how you want to handle this topic from scratch. Um, I've seen a variety of, of startups and tech companies take that approach where if you're starting from zero and you're creating a company, you can really take some time to create the strategy and the structures and the transparency that you want and that will define your culture. The negative piece of this is that I don't see enough um, enough companies doing that. Usually founders have an idea, they're really passionate about something, and so the actual institutionalization and culture building and system building around that becomes, you know, you, you only have 24 hours in the day, and so not enough people spend time building those systems, even for companies that they're about to, for companies that are nascent. And so I would offer that as, as a concrete piece. Um, last but not least, I think the topic of transparency to me is something I, I think is really fascinating. Um, I am personally kind of, I've read about this over the years and there is a kind of, um, a, to me, it feels like a healthy debate on whether or not pay, kind of full pay transparency is a good thing or it ends up incentivizing um, members of your staff or there's kind of different externalities that come from that that some people opine are not very positive and then there are other people who are huge huge proponents in terms of pay transparency either way you look at it, i don't think enough companies do even basic transparency so if anything i would say sometimes the topic of pay transparency can feel really ominous and really stressful and somewhat controversial but the reality is that there are a lot of gradients um, along that it is a gradient and there are other elements there are other options along the way so you can be a lot increasingly more transparent internally and externally without having to necessarily publish everybody's salary. Um, and I would strongly encourage companies, founders, employees to, to advocate for that because there is most of the research suggests that it is a good thing. Thank you so much, Natalia. So much to unpack there. Um, reminders, please. Um, Post your issues and your solutions, share on the solutions. And if you haven't put your questions in there, please do. We're gonna welcome uh, Dr. Ilcheva to now to the Q&A portion. Thank you so much as you all please answer poll number two, which will include this opportunity of, um, of, of strengthening the fabric of our connections. Um, I think it's a it's a very exciting um, opportunity to see how much uh, responsibility we have <laughs> to move the needle here. Um, so I'm going to start um, with uh, the first question that really comes from our our band of interns. 
the four strong, brilliant uh, young women who are working very closely and doing a lot of amazing work with the Women's Fund. Um, what uh, recommendations would you give to them as they leave their UMFIU, Miami-Dade, the, the different uh, educational institutions where they are? What um, tips would you give them to try and find out how can they find the right corporations and how can they find the right workplaces uh, where, where uh, equal pay you know, should reign? And this is a, uh, who, who would like to take this first? Can I, I can't see everybody there. Maria. I can take it first as an educator. I'm, I'm so glad you have such an amazing group of, of um, FIU, UM students who are, who are learning uh, and being introduced to the issues we're, we're talking about today and for the involvement with the Women's Fund. They've, uh, I can say they've taken the first step in, uh, in, their, in their careers uh, in, uh, with regards to paying attention to, to pay equities and, and learning from uh, uh, leading women in, in various sectors. Uh, as a researcher, my first advice would be uh, to do research. Um, you need to find companies, organizations, um, and role models uh, that, uh, that indeed uh, can, can help you, help steer you in your career growth. Um, and especially when you're looking for a company or organization, may make sure that uh, you, you choose the, the right one, uh, both as an individual fit, but also as a, um, um, with, with an understanding of what the co company culture is. Uh, it's time that we start holding companies and organizations, I'm not talking about just the private sector, but the government, nonprofit across the board, uh, hold them to a higher standard. So if that culture is not a good fit, uh, you won't be happy in, in your career. Uh, and it's important, uh, we, we've noted that in our research, if you start from an unhappy place, if you start with a low pay, uh, most likely that will impact your, your future career growth. So do your research on the companies and, and choose the, the right one uh, that will allow you to grow professionally, but more importantly, the one that will, will make you feel valued. I really like this idea that uh, Samaria has been talking about. Realize your, your value and choose the, the company or the, the boss that will appreciate you for, for who you are. Samaria, you have something to add. Absolutely. Um, the doctor is, is so spot on. And I will say, when I did my interviews, the, the one person I spent more time with than anyone uh, was the HR representative. Um, and, and Lynn and the job and the work that she does is so, so, so important. So when I was considering or when I went on job interviews, I wanted more and more time. I wanted more time with the HR person. And that's where I took the time to ask some of those questions around culture and how do people move up in an organization? Talk to me about kind of the typical track. So I got a lot of information from spending time with the HR representative. I also took the time to talk to others that work at the company, right? There's nothing like grabbing a couple of individuals um, that can share with you their own personal experiences. Sometimes they give you the inside track. On, on what you can expect and what they're saying. Um, so those are kind of the two things that, that, that I did, um, particularly when I'm deciding if I'm at a point where I'm having the privilege of sitting down with a company. I spent time with HR. I also got a chance to spend time with people who actually worked at the company, those that were currently there, and maybe even some people that have decided to leave. And it gave me a different perspective um, as I was going into the organization. If I can jump in, I, um, I would say don't be afraid of asking for things. I, I spent so many years sort of, well, I should be appreciative that they even considered me and I have this job and um, ask for changes. I have a friend who um, is a partner at a law firm here in Miami and she became a partner by approaching the partners and saying, look, there is no systematic way to uh, measure how to become a partner here. Um, there's no systematic process for bonuses and raises, and that needs to change. So I would say um, 
advocate for yourself as um, a lot of the panelists have been saying, and then bring, bring others with you. Um, so we're not gonna get anywhere with um, sort of individualized um, thinking and um, individualized raises and things like that. Um, so don't be afraid to sort of Im uh, be an impetus for cultural shifts within a company that you're interested in. Because if, if, um, if they've hired you, it's because they're, they're interested in you and the value you bring. One, one quote um, that I want to maybe share with people that, and particularly when, when uh, this, the whole notion around either um, social inequality, and one of the quotes that I often say is, you know, sharing your voice is, is okay. It's how you share it will determine if you are heard. And I think the how is around the value equation that we talked about. Um, that I specifically talked about in understanding your value and being able to communicate your value. People are interested in dollars and cents, right? At the end of the day, what can you contribute to this organization to help support the mission and vision and also help move the organization forward? When you're speaking in those terms, you will be heard. Not an emotional plea for why you need something, but a, a more value equation plea as to why you deserve what you deserve. And so I just want to make sure that I leave you with that. That to me is something that I've, again, that I've been able to live by and that I you know, share with others, but it's the how and the what will determine if you get what you've asked for. Yeah, I'd like to add and thank Samaria. Um, that's absolutely true. And HR does have such a leading part in bringing talent into the organization and I insert myself into as many of those discussions as humanly possible because no one knows our culture as well as I do. But then I, I think it's equally important and what I do is follow up after somebody's onboarded and they're with us for a month, three months, six months, I always go back to them and I, um, and I really take pride in asking them, so was what I said true? Is it valid? Do you have any surprises? And um, occasionally there's something I hadn't thought of, but I really do think I have um, you know, that is my role is to make sure, you know, it's all about culture. And although it's true, employees will join a company, they will leave a boss. And so it's yeah. also my responsibility to make sure that we uh, have as few um, close to zero bad bosses as possible. And then to the interns that are listening, I just wanted to share, I think internships are a great, great way to try new experiences. They're great to learn what you enjoy, what you don't enjoy. Um, and they can help steer your career. Um, we have a fabulous summer intern program. I would invite any of you, if you're interested to, you know, get a look under the hood of corporate America, please contact me. Uh, we generally run it through the summer. We make sure we introduce um, um, our introductions and have speakers from all of our leadership, um, ways to connect, ways to connect with our, um, you know, uh, uh, social governance as well and environmental programs. And so I, I think it's a fabulous look at a company. And if, uh, if anyone needs help with an internship, reach out and I will certainly do everything in my power to help you. And if I may um, add kind of two thoughts on this. The first is I can't remember the source, but I remember a handful of years ago reading the results of a survey um, that talked about how both women and men, when they are start, when they're doing the re like research around their future, a, a job or a negotiation for salary, when they ask their peers to kind of gauge um, where their peers are at, men generally ask men and women generally ask women. So it's true across both genders. Um, and I can't remember the source of it, but it was around kind of, it was a, a corporate compensation survey. And the suggestion from that report a couple years old at this point, but I think still relevant, is to try to cross those gender um, lines. And so when you're doing research around thinking about ex a new job or switching careers or in some way expediting in some direction, and you're predicting that you have a salary negotiation ahead of you, or you're thinking about what things could be suitable for you salary-wise, asking both the men in your network and the men and the women in your network. So that's kind of one small thing. Um, and the other kind of thought, 
I think this is very relevant for smaller companies and definitely for startups. I think if there's less wiggle room to, or less of, a, of this kind of wiggle room in terms of larger companies, or at least the larger companies that I've worked at, but they have a different version of this. I think any employer has more flexibility than one assumes and one realizes. And so I am of the opinion that one should always ask and always inquire um, and come with a flexible and creative mindset. I've personally negotiated around salaries um, you know, understanding that there's a starting salary today, but negotiating for three or five years out. So negotiating for a salary curve that I have visibility into and that both I am committed to based on my performance and my employer is committed to, for example. And so I can back into the salary that I want in a, at a faster rate, for example, than if I just assumed, well, this is my starting salary and I'll just take it as such. Um, or I, I have a, one of my mentors, for example, has a story from when she was working on Wall Street where she was being hired by another firm. And she was negotiating in the salary negotiation. They didn't, there didn't seem to be a lot of wiggle room until she realized that they had um, a relocation bonus assigned to some of these roles. And so she asked for the relocation bonus that would have been assigned to this hire had it been someone else. She didn't need to relocate, but she asked for that relocation bonus to be reassigned um, for some other expenses that she had that normally wouldn't really have been considered um, kind of eligible expenses for a company to cover. And so there's all of this to say that there is a there is flexibility if one comes, especially around startups and negotiating for equity, negotiating for um, salary curves and negotiating for different types of promotions and timelines. So you may not have exactly what you want today, but you can think through different avenues of getting what you want in a year to two years or three years. So smart. Very, very interesting. I'm going to ask our team to launch the next poll. I asked this question. So it was asked and Dr. Elteva answered, um, are there any pieces of legislation ordinances we can pass on a municipal level? There may be more. Uh, the answer that Dr. Elteva you gave um, is that in 2017 legislation was passed. However, the county does not have a mechanism to, to verify, like uh, Monica briefly touched on. Are there best practices in other communities, in other uh, county or local governments that uh, we could look to emulate and uh, ask our, our elected leaders to support? Yes, it's, ab it's absolutely doable to create a best practices document um, for the private sector. We're also, for this um, recommendation report that we're putting together that Carolina shared in the, the chat, um, based on the status of women report that Dr. Lincheva leads, um, we are looking at um, putting together a document for best practices, uh, putting together a document that, um, talks about the salary ranges that people can expect. Um, this is a, a process where we can make recommendations to our, our local government um, to even create a point system for county contractors. So like, as I said, we are not able at the county to um, kind of control private businesses, but if private businesses wanna enter uh, into a contract with the county, we can assign a point system, for example, and enforce that point system and actually use it um, to say if a company has paid leave policies, they get extra points. If they um, have longer parental paid leave, they get extra points. If they have paid transparency, they get extra points. And that, that can be a system that we, uh, the county awards contracts based off of. Fantastic. So I have to say that there's so much work to be done. And if we can tie back again one more time to the economic benefits of achieving equal pay, I think, uh, Dr. Oteba, if you'd like to say them again, what we could do with the poverty levels, what we could do with the ripple effects, can, can you state those for us in, in, to tie this portion up? Yes, uh, very quickly again, uh, based on, uh, uh, I think uh, someone mentioned that uh, as well, but I want to uh, say that it's, uh, we shouldn't look at it from the perspective of a loss. It's an opportunity gap. It's an opportunity for women to, uh, to, to help themselves and to help their families and to help the, the, the local economy, the economy in which they work. 
So in Miami-Dade County, based on 2018 data, um, if we uh, had pay equity, um, it would have produced an additional two billion in earnings for women and their families, uh, and another one billion would have been um, uh, would have been the impact. So in total, three billion would have been added to to the local economy, reducing pover the poverty rate by half. This is significant. We, we have over 400,000 families living in poverty in Miami-Dade County, over 400,000. So reducing the, the poverty by, by half is, is going to have a huge impact on, on these families and, and on our economy. So I'm going to give our collective call to action, not only to change these things in our intern's lifetime, but also to change our local economy under our watch. It's gonna take some real effort, but we have the tools. It's very, very, very clear to me today. I think I always wanted to believe it, but I thank you all for your expertise in, in showing us how that is true. And um, I have to say that I think that the equal pay companies, you're probably not the only ones, but many people haven't taken the pledge. I hope you encourage others to do it and brag about it and wield the strength of that amazing uh, claim and encourage others to join you. Speaking of joining, please join all of us in celebrating the life and the legacy of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And if you didn't know already, next slide, please, Vivi. Um, oh, uh, sorry. I, I wanted you to know that uh, the uh, RBG uh, actually passed away on nothing less than equal International Equal Pay Day. So that's a full circle. We need to honor her legacy. The census deadline date is currently October 5th. If you know anyone who has not filled it in, please, just like our voting, use our power to act. Meet the deadline, beat the deadline, encourage everyone. It does make a huge difference, especially in Miami-Dade County, where we need the funds. Speaking of funds, Give Miami Day is coming, and we, your Women's Fund, definitely need your support. It will be November 19th but because we, just as everybody in our community, are suffering from the impacts of the pandemic. Early giving is being uh, sponsored by the, the Miami Foundation to commence on November 16th. So please consider being a champion for us for the Women's Fund Miami Day during Give Miami Day and, and don't, let it, don't let it pass. We need your support because we need to keep on focusing this gender lens. Your feedback is so important to us. Please complete the exit survey, share the recording of this Impact Collaborative, and join us on the first Thursday of every month. Next time it will be November 5th, 2020, for Girls and Women's Mental Health, COVID-19, Impacts, and Paths to Resilience. Thank you, everyone, on and off camera. Stay well and stay strong.